to get going then. Uh, that's our outline for the day, um, which you've been sent, but it's just a sort of map of, of what we're doing. So basically lecture followed by a workshop this morning. I've put, built in a two hour break in order for any of you who have not had a chance to look at the um, course materials to um, uh, you, the uh, data you can have a look during the lunch break. And then we've got again a lecture and a workshop this afternoon. Um, okay, so that's the outline. So let's um, go straight into the uh, first lecture, which is uh, an introduction to the idea of analysis. Um, so I'm going to look at some principles of analysis and unpick that idea of it being an intuitive process um, and then come on to some in this morning lecture look at some broad analytical strategies the idea of a, a conceptual scaffolding which summarizes describes and explains um, abductive logic which uh, uh, you know it's uh, really uh, wonderful to discover abductive logic. Sometimes we don't know what it is we're doing and then we find a label that just fits what we're doing. Um, and developing theoretically informed analysis. Those are uh, sort of three broad strategies that I'm gonna pull out this morning. Um, uh, and then the importance of developing an overarching analytical strategy, which runs through the whole research process. And I'm gonna illustrate that by looking at some of the um, analytical strategies that we use for generating data and how that then feeds in to the natural uh, analysis of data. Now the illustrations for this uh, course are all taken from qualitative longitudinal research. That's uh, the area that I know best. And uh, when we do QL research, what we're doing is following the same people um, or organizations, for example, or communities in real time to discern change in the making. Um, so you'll gain some insights, particularly into QLA, qualitative longitudinal um, analysis. Um, there isn't, uh, there's a huge amount to say, and I can only sort of summarize today. So I would go to the course reader if you want to flesh out uh, the picture. Okay. So analysis then. Um, I'm going to suggest here that it's very much an enigmatic process. If you feel you're not quite grasp what analysis is or what it is you're doing, then rest assured you're not alone. It's the most uh, complex, least well-documented aspects of, uh, of qualitative longitudinal inquiry. Um, there are many approaches, no clear rules for what to do. So researchers often use a, a jackdaw approach, uh, drawing on, a different, on different research traditions and combining them to create a bespoke design. In fact, there are, are as many kinds of analysis as there are studies themselves, and that's fine. Remember that methodology is a work in progress and you can shape it. Um, it's not that you have to do a pick and mix. Um, here's Richie and Lewis, one of my, uh, some of my favorite authors uh, for methodology. They say, researchers are bewildered by which approach to take. Should they take a constructionist approach, IPA or grounded theory? When they investigate a particular tradition in more detail, they may well discover that there are many different versions of that tradition, as well as considerable overlap between them at a practical level. Researchers should not be forced into a theoretical or methodological straitjacket. So that idea that you've got to find, you know, the perfect package as if it's out there isn't, isn't how to think of it. Uh, instead of it, you know, instead think about it, uh, that you're going to draw down ideas that uh, are right for your particular project, your analytical um, uh, strategies that you need for your particular project. Um, Plummer, um, Ken Plummer's uh, 2001 work. And by the way, these references are all in the course reader. Um, so that, that's where you can find them. Uh, Plummer says, getting the story can be fun. It's also the hardest process to describe. And it's enigmatic. Um, Hen and et al say, conjures up images of an unwieldy process characterized by lone researchers wallowing in paperwork. Um, and uh, Spencer here, uh, it's described as, as an obscure and esoteric process shrouded in intellectual mystery, or a largely haphazard serendipitous process with discovery falling from the evidence as if somehow by chance. Now I have to say that there is a, a large element of truth in all of these um, views of analysis. 
Um, but that, that I think we can't let ourselves, well, myself as a, a methodology trainer, that, uh, you know, we need to try and do a bit better than that um, and try to unpick what, what it's about so that you've got um, some metaphors to hang on to so that it, you know what it is you're trying to do. But overall, it's commonly seen as an intuitive process. I think it is. Um, when I arrived in Leeds in 1994, uh, I was uh, uh, applied for a research fellow job here. And when I was interviewed, I was asked how I did my analysis. And I said, well, it's an intuitive process, but they gave me the job anyway. But I, I'm just going to query that and say, is that all there is to it? Are there other things that we can bring in uh, to um, make it a little bit more concrete than that? OK. Okay, so what are we trying to do when we analyze? Well, Saldana says the purpose and outcome of data analysis is to reveal fresh insights about the human condition. Again, it's a very broad, somewhat woolly statement. Let's go back to de dictionary definitions. When we analyze, we study or examine something in an organized way to learn more about it. And that is likely to involve some element of breaking a thing down into its constitu constituent elements to understand how those elements are connected, how they fit together. What I want to suggest is it's the ability to interrogate, interpret and explain that's at the heart of the enterprise. So what we're aiming to do when we analyze is to develop plausible accounts of social processes and practices. Um, and I'm gonna suggest that we need to develop an overarching analytical strategy for a project. Um, and I'm gonna now draw out three elements of an analytical strategy for us to, to consider. Um, firstly, the idea of a conceptual ladder um, or a scaffolding for your project. Um, qualitative analysis can be thought of as an intellectual journey that leads from summative to descriptive to interpretive accounts. So let's start with summarizing and describing. The size and complexity of data that we're likely to gather as qualitative or QL researchers makes this essential to condense that data down and reorder it into some new kind of configuration. And that enables the researcher to see the data set as a whole and read across it to compare, contrast, connect, categorize data into new, uh, in new ways. Now, there's a whole variety of different tools to aid those processes, and we're going to come onto those this afternoon. Okay. Um, but then we move on to um, interpretation and explanation. And I have to say there are no, uh, that's a conceptual leap from description to explanation. And there are no tools of the trade that can do this for us. This is where intuition does come in. Um, it's the analytical skills of the researcher, either working alone or in conversation with others. This afternoon, you'll be in conversation when you analyze some data and you hopefully will begin to see the value of doing that. You know, you could form small groups and share data and brainstorm, it's always a really good exercise to do that. Don't feel that you're doing it necessarily on your own. So we can think of this process of moving from summarizing to description to interpretation as a conceptual scaffolding or a ladder, it's sometimes called a ladder of analytical abstraction. Um, and I think the best description of it is in Ritchie and Lewis 2003. So what we're doing is we, we move up and down the scaffolding, the ladder, and we're drawing on the data at the lower levels to summarize and describe. That's where we are with our raw data at the bottom of the ladder. And then as we go up, um, we're going into the higher levels and we can test whatever insights are emerging against wider knowledge and evidence, key ideas, existing insights towards the top of the ladder. And then we shuttle back down the scaffolding to check against the original data. So all the time we're engaging with pre-existing theories but we're remaining empirically grounded. This is an iterative process, this shuttling up and down the ladder. We're moving back and forth between different levels of abstraction. And in that process, we build layers of interpretation as we go along. Um, I want to come on to the, the second uh, strategy, which I find really helpful for me, which is the notion of abductive logic. 
Um, and through this, we combine intuition with precision. <clears throat> this is what underpins the ladder of analytical abstraction, the logic of abduction. This is a very creative and exploratory mode of discovery and knowledge building, ideally suited for qualitative inquiry. And it involves two modes of, of discovery. The first is intuition, an imaginative, creative and interpretive mode of exploration to discern the essential meaning of, of things, the essential truths in things, if you like. This is where intuition comes in. And because it's interpretive, it fits the interpretive, uh, interpretive mode of inquiry that qualitative researchers use. And then the second mode of discovery is precision. This is a painstaking, meticulous process of piecing together a mosaic of substantial and conceptual um, themes and insights. So again, abduction relies on iteration, this reflexive process of continuous meaning making through which a mosaic of insights are gradually distilled. And we can zigzag back and forth between our theoretical knowledge, our ideas, themes, concepts, and our rich situated empirical evidence. Uh, that's what we're doing. So here are some nice quotations which kind of uh, sum this up. This is again from Ken Plummer. He says, this is the truly creative part of the work that we do. It entails brooding and reflecting upon mounds of data for long periods of time until it makes sense and feels right and key ideas and themes flow from it. Okay. Uh, Gruber, and I would recommend that you read Gruber's wonderful article from 1981. It's a, an absolute classic. He said, he, the researcher goes over the same ground many times. She focuses now on this particular aspect, now on that, now on the problem as a whole. He looks at it from varying points of view, diagrams it, verbalizes it, constructs visual images, studies the same idea, works through by different means and in different modalities. The same idea felt and then thought and then felt again, but in a new way. For now, the feeling contains the new thought. And he goes on, deep understanding of a domain of knowledge requires knowing it in various ways. So this multiplicity of perspectives grows slowly through hard work and sets the stage for the recognition we experience as a new insight. This afternoon, we'll come on to how we can interrogate data through different lenses, which uh, builds our understanding. So we're interrogating, systematically reading and immersing ourselves in the data. Uh, and we can do that systematically by um, asking a, a key number of questions of the data. So that's part of the trick that you formulate some questions and then you interrogate your data with your questions. Um, and that enables you to examine it through different lenses. So asking the right kind of questions of your data is, is part of the key to effective analysis. So you're not just reading blindly, uh, you're going in with a particular lens. Just a, another word about induction and deduction. Um, sorry, uh, abduction. How does it relate to induction and deduction? And is there a sequence to it? Well, abduction um, arguably uh, supersedes both induction and deduction and it encompasses both of them. Induction is a bottom-up process that apparently derives theory from observation alone. Deduction, a top-down approach that starts with a, a theoretical hypothesis and tests it in the field. Induction and deduction alone give us only half the picture. And in fact, induction in the way that I've described it here is impossible because data are never, never gathered neutrally. They're always theoretically informed. We always have a theoretical starting point, even if we're not aware of what it is, which is why we need to be upfront about our theories. So when we combine these strategies, we're doing both induction and deduction uh, through the logic of abduction then we're on much stronger analytical grounds and we're, that's an iteration, a zigzag between the two. And in terms of a sequence, well, abduction doesn't have a clear beginning or sequence or ending. It evolves dynamically through the continual interplay of your rich theoretical ideas and your new empirical evidence. It may well be that you have an early hunch, you know, a light bulb moment, a eureka moment, a, what Gruber calls an aha moment. Uh, that may then be followed by a painstaking gathering of empirical evidence. Or it might happen the other way around. It may well be that you go through months of careful discovery, building an evidence base, and then that culminates in an aha moment, the point of synthesis 
from which a new vision of the world begins to form. So overall here, I'm really trying to pull out the fact that analysis is intuitive, but this is tempered and strengthened by a systematic, careful piecing together of the available empirical evidence. And again, Ritchie and Lewis say this so nicely. They say, analysis requires a mix of creativity and systematic reading, a blend of inspiration and diligent detection. So that I think is the process. When I read about these things, like what Richie and Lewis say, I have an aha moment because I think, yes, that's what I'm doing. And now I've got a label for it and I can hang on to it. I've got some metaphors to help me understand what it is I'm doing. Now the third um, uh, dimension, if you like, of um, uh, an analytical strategy, strategy is to think about the theoretical drivers. Um, we need theory. And, and here, uh, Holstein and Gabriel, wonderful writers, um, I recommend you, you have a look at some of their work. They say methods of analysis do not emerge out of thin air. They are informed by and extend out of particular theoretical sensibilities. Methods of analysis should not be viewed as a cafeteria of options where one picks and chooses according to immediate preferences. Any form of research strategy has its proper conceptual precursors. And Burroway says it more bluntly, we don't start with data, we start with theory. Without theory, we are blind, we cannot see the world. Norman Blakey, um, I find his work really very helpful. He says in any kind of social research, design is driven by a key methodological question. What kinds of connections are possible between three different facets of knowledge? The first are our social experiences and practices. And for me, we can get at that through cases, our case data. Secondly, key ideas, existing sources of knowledge, our substantive themes. That's uh, the thema uh, thematic uh, dimension of our research. And the third connection is the nature of social reality, our ontological understandings. Uh, and this is where we need to be a bit more upfront and think through uh, what is our ontological understanding? What is the nature of social reality that we are trying to grasp in our research? Now for QL researchers, the nature of social reality um, is the world is fluid and um, processual. And because of that, for QL analysis, um, we are driven by a processual logic that informs the way we think about cases and themes. So if we're looking at connections, we're looking at the connections between cases, themes, and processes. That may not apply for your research, uh, but for, for QL researchers generally, that's the kind of thing that we're doing. And I want to say a little bit more about the processual term because I think it's really important and whether you are doing uh, QL research or you're just going out to the field once, you may well find that you're engaged with some of these ideas in any case. There's been a broad shift in the focus of social inquiry building over, over decades from static structures to dynamic processes. And here's John Law after Method, that's an uh, interesting book, he says, the world is not a structure, something we can map with our social science charts. We might think of it instead as a maelstrom or a tide rip, filled with currents, eddies, flows, vortices, unpredictable changes, storms, and with moments of lull and calm. And he goes on, we begin to imagine what research methods might be if they were adapted to a world that included and knew itself as tide, flux, and general unpredictability. Now that's John Law writing in 2004, but these are not new ideas. Um, I, they go back particularly, I think, to um, uh, Henri Bergson, uh, writing around the turn of the 20th century uh, in his introduction to, to metaphysics. He says, there do not exist things that are made, but only in the making, not states that remain fixed, but only states in process of change, of becoming. Rest, he says, is apparent or rather relative. We arrive at fluid concepts capable of following reality in all its windings. That was really uh, influential from Bergson uh, around the turn of the 20th century, it fed into uh, the work of so many philosophers, Whitehead, Heidegger, uh, wonderful writers like uh, Proust and Sartre. So all of this gives us then a basic insight 
If the social world is fluid and perpetually flowing and becoming and oscillating and unfolding, we need fluid modes of inquiry to understand it. For me, that's why I do QL research. And I should say here also that these ideas go back to Heraclitus, you know, <laughs> ancient history. Uh, these ideas have been around. Uh, now, this processual turn is very widespread and pervasive. It's seeped into the very foundations of, uh, of interpretivist social inquiry, not only explicitly, uh, you know, in the fields that I work in, QL research, re-studies, life history, biography. It's there in narrative inquiry, constructionist grounded theory, critical realism, complexity theory, and so on. This is the point um, that Richie and Lewis were making earlier when they said, when you come to look closely, you'll see that there are many parallels between these different fields. So whether or not you're planning or doing a QL study, then you'll, you may well find that your research is underpinned by a processual logic um, or, and or that you are engaged with some kind of complex causal understanding and explanation. Because as researchers, we are in, indeed expected to explain how things come about, the causes and consequences of change. That's often what we're required to do. And it may well be that, you know, any, any time that you say that something influences something else or transforms it, that is a causal claim. And if you want to know more about complex causality, I've put uh, details here of a, a, a recent article of mine which explores that idea of fluid inquiry and complex causality and how we might build that into policy processes. So, um, now, uh, the other thing I want to say, having gone through those three different elements of an analytical strategy, is the notion that we need an overarching strategy for our research. It's, it's, analysis is not simply about how we interrogate data. It's a strategy that runs like a unifying thread through the whole of the research process. That might be particularly interesting for those of you who are doing MA uh, level or first year uh, of your doctorates because you've got time to think about how you build those unifying threads. If you're in your third year and you've already got your data, all is not lost because you can retrospectively find the threads. A robust analytical strategy will shape our research questions, what we want to find out, what do we need to know? And here is good old Einstein saying the formulation of a problem is often more essential than its solution. Uh, that analytical strategy will shape who we will question, the way we sample, how we will ask the questions and generate data in the field, and then finally, how we organise and interpret our data and convey our findings. So we need to think more broadly to develop an analytical strategy that will provide a coherent structure and anchor for our research project as a whole. The QL inquiry, and for me in particular, that case theme process logic is a strategy um, that threads through the whole research process. And it's one that we're going to explore further today. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is just turn um, briefly at, at the end of this uh, lecture to generating data. And um, I want to turn to this to illustrate how the analytical logic of QL research, that attention to cases, themes and processes, how it shapes the whole research journey because how we generate our data impacts hugely on how we are then able to analyze it. So just a word about generating data, as we know, and, and forgive me, I'm going over some very basic um, ideas um, in this. I, I think it's, um, you know, you may well be very familiar with them, but sometimes it's useful to go back to the basics and just rethink it a little bit. So we can generate data uh, through interviewing, that's uh, we're generating narratives of, of lives as told. And if we're revisiting people as retold through time, and that's the most widespread method that we have. <clears throat> we can also generate data through ethnography and we get at the lives as lived. Legacy data research, more often called uh, secondary analysis. These are lives as, as documented, already documented. Uh, drawing down data and participatory methods where we can get at self-documented lives. And these are all uh, in the mix, often combined very effectively by researchers. <clears throat> I want to talk about life journey interviewing now, because this is how we can build processes uh, into the way we generate our data. 
Um, if we generate dynamic data, we can see how part of the participants see their lives unfolding. We can get their backstory. How did they arrive at the present day? What has influenced the journey so far? Um, are they where they hoped to be? What are their plans and hopes for the future? And how do they envisage getting there? And there are some uh, you know, various strategies we can use. We can use a variety of continuity questions, then and now questions, what if questions, where next questions. And we can ask this at each follow-up and that creates a nice dynamic through line in the data to aid analysis. It means that when you go to look at your data, you've already got the threads there that you can begin to connect from one period of time to another. But that continuity is also balanced by flexibility. And this allows the researcher to formulate new lines of inquiry that are in tune with evolving lives. Because we need, when we do QL research, to follow lives where they lead. So each research encounter informs the next in a cumulative process of building insights. We are mirroring the flux of the real world. And we can frame our questions in dynamic ways. So for example, um, we're not just necessarily focused on, on education or uh, um, health or so in. We're interested in educational journeys and pathways and trajectories or health journeys. Um, and this enables us to gain insight into the nature and causes and consequences of change and continuity for our participants the influence of earlier events on later experiences, for example. So the main point here is that the nature of the journey is just as important as the destination reached. This is not just about outcomes. It's about the process by which you get there. It's about how things happen, how things unfold. For QL researchers, now I'm, I'm gonna suggest that life journey interviewing, that can be done as a snapshot at one visit to the field. Uh, as a QL researcher, you can build on that by doing recursive interviewing. Every time you revisit the field, you can revisit past and future and to see how people overwrite their biographies. That means that we can then compare people's accounts of how they see the future with what actually happens when we get there. We can explore how and why people have maintained uh, a particular path or strayed from that path. We can also uncover changes in perception as well as changes in practices. And we can discern how people's narratives, their lives as told, are continually readjusted to their lives as lived. So that's uh, something else that's very important in terms of building process in for QL researchers. I wanna suggest now that interviewing in itself is an analytical process. You know, we have to move away from that idea that we go out and gather their data, and then we analyze it. We, we, the whole process is analytical because what happens is the researchers and participants, and I'm sure you'll all be very familiar with these ideas, what we're doing is jointly constructing meaning and knowledge in an interview. The accounts then are actively generated. They're not simply out there in a realist sense to be harvested or mined or collected. And that's why I use the language of generating data instead of just collecting data, as if it's just there for us to pick up. And Haravan says this beautifully. She says, the interviewer is like a medium, conjuring memories through his or her own presence, interests and questions. Offering a glimpse not only into the sequence of events in people's lives, but how in their search for a pattern, the different pieces of their lives are reassembled and disassembled as in a kaleidoscope, losing meaning, changing meaning, disappearing and reappearing in different configurations at different points in time. Okay, so that's interviewing. And I want to come uh, on now and say a word about uh, participatory methods, um, self-documented lives. And the reason I'm pulling these out is that um, in a moment, you're all going to be doing some interviewing and using participatory methods in your workshop. We can invite people to map out, record or narrate their own lives using tools such as life maps, diaries, videos, autobiographical accounts of the past or of an imaginary future. So these give us not simply an event-based chronological journey, kind of what happens next approach, although we do get at that, but we can also glean something of the interior logic of lives and understanding of people's emotional journeys, their experiential journeys, the much more intricate details of how processes actually unfold. Now, life maps can be 
produced during an interview, while diary methods, written or visual diaries can be used between interviews to gain insights into what is happening between fieldwork visits. So uh, really interesting and good tools for you know, building a more nuanced and intricate understanding of how processes are unfolding when we can't be there all the time, of course. I wanna give some examples of life maps now. This is from uh, Gwinnett and Marshall. It's one of my favorite images. This particular study um, was, uh, this is from Melanie's uh, drawing. Um, this was a study of women who had been abused and the impact of that abuse on their employment journeys. So it's looking at two trajectories and looking at the intersection between them. And Melanie uses a lot of color in her map. It's a nice meandering journey. You can see little whorls of, of color, blue and green, um, where she has little detours and explores new avenues. You can see uh, an area of black uh, and a big black jagged line. Those are the times of abuse. And then she comes around a big downward path here. And then she's beginning to spiral up through a nice rainbow and beginning to flourish again. The whole point about this map um, is that Melanie, as she begins to draw it, is then able to articulate her experiences through the process of producing a map like this. They're really good tools to think with, enabling people to say things which are sometimes almost unthinkable. Um, other examples of life maps. This is a 14-year-old from the Young Lives and Time study. Um, much more linear, uh, but never mind. Um, uh, this particular participant was born in 1993. She's got little milestones along the way. Uh, she's exploring what's happening in her family, birth of a sister, death of her granny. Uh, she had cancer when she was a baby. Um, her school uh, milestones are there. This time she started high school uh, and one of her best friends left the country. She's also got um, some historical events that really um, shook her, the Twin Towers being knocked down, the start and beginning uh, of the Iraq war. We can also, also use these life maps to glean something of the future. And here is a young father, and you're gonna be doing a lot on young fathers this afternoon. Uh, and this particular young father, he, he's starting with now and then going to death, you know, so it's a sort of future line. And it's very interesting because he wants now um, to hold a successful job, get a job, because he hasn't got one. He wants to see Luke grow up, go to college and then uni. He imagines Luke joining school and getting good grades and going to college. And he wants to find a good girlfriend who Luke will like because he's not with the mother of Luke. He wants to see Luke achieve everything he wants to and he wants to be a granddad eventually. So he has many, many aspirations and they're all built round um, the life of his child, uh, which is just really interesting. We can then use these tools to draw out particular narratives. Okay, I'm just gonna sum up now uh, from what I've been talking about this morning. I've tried to highlight three elements of a broad analytical strategy for social research that um, shows what we're trying to do when we're analyzing. The idea of this conceptual ladder that enables us to grasp the conceptual development from summarizing to describing to interpreting. The abductive logic that underpins this approach, which uses iteration between key ideas and empirical evidence and through which analysis becomes a really robust mixture of intuition and precision. And then the importance of theory in the analytical process, that continual interplay between um, sometimes very grand theoretical ideas like the processual turn, um, more specific uh, theoretical insights in our particular fields and new empirical evidence. And for QL research, that means exploring cases and themes through a processual lens. What we're aiming to do is to achieve case depth, thematic breadth, but also temporal reach in, in QL inquiry. Now, the ideas I've been presenting today are, um, are very broad. I know I'm looking at an overarching analytical strategy and I've suggested that we need that because it runs, as I've said, like a unifying thread through the whole process. And I, so it's just, to, to point up the idea that data analysis is just one phase of the analytical process and it needs to build on and be in harmony with the previous phases. 
we've seen that interviewing in itself is an analytical process. If we can generate a data set that is rich in descriptive detail and explanatory insight, then the task of analysis is already halfway there. That idea of developing plausible accounts of social processes, because we've already got solid analytical foundations generated with our participants upon which we can build. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, and um, Anna, can we, uh, if we've now got time, I think, to do some Q&A, if anybody's got any questions. Um, I mean, I, 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 you know, I think uh, there's quite a lot of research where uh, it's almost like creating an oral history project where you're going to document these very important uh, and um, distinctive, unique and difficult stories. And we need to document them. Um, and in fact, as I said, the analysis is half done if you gather the data and you know, generate the data in such a way that enables and encourages people um, to reflect themselves on their on their circumstances. So um, uh, I don't think you should shy away from participatory methods. Um, I mean, uh, there are some tools, and if you want to go back to the course reader, there are life history charts and they take four hours to fill in. You know, you don't necessarily want that. But using a, a simple life map, um, as, like the ones I've just put up on the screen, um, that enables, you know, as I said, that's the, the self-documented life. And people can encapsulate their experiences in a, in a nice line, uh, you know, a wavy line, a spiral, and use that as a tool to open up about these very difficult issues. And um, so it's just to encourage you really to say, uh, you know, I, I think bearing in mind the experiences that you want to get at. Um, and, and of course, the ethics of it, as you say, are, you know, are really very important in a, uh, you know, in the world that we live in. Um, again, there's a whole chapter on ethics um, and how we can draw out accounts, but make sure that we're protecting people. Um, you can look at those sorts of ideas in the course reader as well. I, I hope that gives you some insight for sure. I mean, I, we all start with theory. I mean, it, we, just some of us are more upfront about it than others, you know? So I think uh, it's fine. You, you bring it in from the beginning, you know, really, uh, you know, the analytical strategy uh, is there from the outset and the more you can be upfront about that the better um, and and <clears throat> I think uh, how I would do it I mean again there's an example of this in the course reader if you want to follow it up <clears throat> um, but for those of you just starting out I've always found it really helpful to create a kind of conceptual roadmap for my research um, and it's like a big chart and in the first column I've got my research questions and I have to tell you that once you've got your research questions in place, you're not stuck with them. They're not fixed because it may well be down the line. You, you come across another burning question that you, you, you know, and you go back and revise your questions. You can modify and refine your, your questions. It's fine. That's the iteration. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, so you, in the, your first column, you've got your research questions. In your second column, you've got some sub questions. So you're breaking them down into you know, quite specific things that you need to find out. And all of that is mapped against your theoretical premises that, that start your research. That's where you are kind of working it deductively because you're starting with theory, that's fine. And then as you're going along in the next column, what sources of data do you need? Um, obviously you're gonna do some documentary research. You're gonna draw on existing bodies of evidence, but it may well be that there are particular people, groups, communities that you want to interview. And um, it may well be that you want to use documentary sources and go to archives and use related. And you can, so in that column, you're listing your sources of, of data. In the next column, you're working out what are your key themes. And I'm gonna come on to this this afternoon, but you can work with emblematic themes. It may well be that you've got 10 emblematic themes that are driving your research, list them there. And in the final column, what is it you're gonna ask in the field that enables you to get at that? Now, the idea of that conceptual roadmap is that by the time you've gathered all your data together, you've generated it, as I would say, you have sometimes so lost in the project, you've lost sight of where you are in the beginning, but you've got your conceptual roadmap and you can look back across through the map and think, oh, where was I? Oh, that's right, that's what I was trying to find out. 
and you can draw a link between the two. So I think for anybody starting out, or even if you're not, retrospectively, get yourself a conceptual roadmap. There's a really good example in the course reader if you want to, to follow that up, or I can just send you uh, it if you don't want to get the, the course reader. So that's one thing I would suggest. I mean, uh, again, to come back to your, your question, Rasmus, which is a great question, um, you know, this idea of uh, working abductively, it means you can draw on induction and deduction and combine them. So in the following Young Fathers study, we started out with a number of emblematic themes which we, were important for us. Uh, we obviously wanted to find out about the young men's housing and their employment journeys, for example. We wanted to find out in particular about their relationships with their children and how the relationship with other family members influenced that. But we also came across some new themes that became very important. One of which was the relationship with the grandparents. We hadn't realized how influential and how significant that would be, but it emerged out of the data. We also found a lot of important um, uh, insight for the young men who'd been in custody and the young men who'd ex uh, who were engaged with or experienced domestic violence and who had mental health problems. So those were in themes that arose inductively and we were then able to combine them uh, in the way that we interrogated our data. Is that, does that help as a, a way in? Okay, great. You have another question. Well, you've got some comments in the in the chat as well, um, Ren. Or you know, Shivani loves the life maps and thought. <laughs> Hope you could have come across them a bit earlier. That happens quite frequently. <laughs> um, and then Charlene, she Charlene, she's going to ask a question now. Charlene, but you were you were writing in the chat that you are struggling a little bit with linking um all the data and also how hard it is to find these kind of not probably small theories, but an overarching theory. Data, you have to go back to your supervisor. You know, there's always a negotiation going on between you and you are the people that are driving new approaches. Remember, methodology is a work in process. There's nothing fixed or ossified about it. Uh, I'm, I'm coming at you today with some suggestions for how you might think about this. But if you go and read some other researchers, they'll come up with other ideas because analysis is a very uh, open intuitive process, right? So, I mean, there might be four key themes, but there for you might be six or 10 or two. Do you see what I mean? So you've got to stick with your guns. You're doing question led research and you're doing, you know, data that you're led by your data uh, and how you've gathered it uh, in terms of uh, how, what, what you come up with in the end. So you might, um, you know, have that conversation. Actually, I know you want me to, to find four, but I've, I've found seven here and I'm going to wheeze them all in. I mean, often that gets structured around the fact that in a thesis, we have three or four chapters, you know, chapter that covers two key themes. Uh, I have a question, Bren. Yep. Um, <laughs> I'm taking my chest privilege in here. So with, you know, when you were talking about in terms of, and I know it, it may be a bit too advanced, but if you're using qualitative data to interview participants, but not from a constructivist perspective, but you go either a critical realist or, a, you know, any type of realist perspective, where you're trying to look for explanations that say for evaluation of program, program evaluation and everything. We normally say that we use reintroduction so I know you've put you've put you've put it as a different from abduction in this sense of you know you you kind of looking for for how the circumstances will change what you're seeing. It's a very simplistic way of saying it. So oh, I okay. just can. So how, how I know you said you put kindly put a, a reference in there about that you you talk about this um, this different type of analysis, but I just wonder whether you had any very you know summarizing thoughts on it. Good question. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, the idea of abduction came from the work of Pierce, um, again, mm. over 100 years ago, you know, old, old ideas, we, we often, you know, we have to go back to, to the old masters, or, or mistresses to find Absolutely. who we are. Um, but when Pierce first came up with his theory of abduction, he called it retroduction. Um, and retroduction is part of abduction. Uh, because one of the things about weaving back and forth, zigzagging 
between your theoretical premises and your empirical data, you can zigzag in so many different ways. And, and when you're doing research through time, you're zigzagging all the time between past and present and future. So what you, what, every time you're in the field, you're going to zigzag backwards. You're going to go back and that's the retroduction, going back and piecing together a process through what you know from the present day backwards in time. You might also want to go forward. Um, so that's the retroduction is when you, when you trace backwards in time. Um, so it's, uh, there's a little bit this afternoon about process tracing and how we do that, but uh, again, a lot more in the book. Um, but it's a, it's a really good question. So retroduction is part of abduction. It's, it's a really good question. And uh, I mean, I, I think partly for me, I, I, I had I'd none of this kind of training when I was doing my PhD. I was pretty well isolated. Um, but uh, I think um, one, of the, one of the tricks to it is to uh, adopt this idea that you're, it's a conversational interview. Um, it's not that you know that you are the interviewer asking the questions and then you're going to get an answer. The work of Cavale, the interview, um, not as a minor interview, but a kind of um, a wandering interview where, you, and it's this idea that we've we've well I've built into QL research that actually we are walking alongside our participants almost on a journey together. And mm -hmm. we're talking as we're walking. You know, you can think of it as a nice metaphor for it. But I suppose the thing is, I mean, when I start an interview and I've interviewed children as young as four, how can a four-year-old have? But of course, mm -hmm. you're saying to people, you're the experts in your own life. So it's how you frame it. You know, you're the expert in your own life and you're free to tell me as much or as little as you choose today. Um, that, you know, it's just a, a, a tip, you know, for, for how you might kind of start off, such as uh, for ethical reasons, um, adopt this idea that they're going to say to people, if you tell me anything that really worries me, I'm going to have to go and tell the authorities. Not quite like that, but, you know, um, and I never say that. Uh, what I might do at the end is say, look, you've told me some things today that are worrying. Um, and then I would renegotiate the confidentiality. But I always say to people, this is a completely safe space for you. You can tell me whatever you like and it won't go anywhere else. And that frees people up. And often with, uh, with young people, they'll say to me, I'm, I'll talk to you, but I don't, you're not going to tell my parents what I say, are you? Absolutely not. You know, this is, this is a, a confidential safe space for you. And um, so you're gradually giving your participant confidence that they are the experts in their own lives. OK, and so it's not a matter of I mean, if you sort of say to people, what do you mean by that? You know, that might seem, a, you know, but it, and if you use the tools like uh, the life maps, um, people suddenly realize just what knowledge they have about their own lives. You know, so you can it's just a very subtle encouragement to draw. Yeah. them out. You'll see this afternoon that, of course, it doesn't always work. I and mean, if you look at Andrew's, some of you may have already looked at Andrew's case data. I hope some of you will, you know, and, and some people. Uh, really struggle to articulate and and often our cases that we choose our emblematic cases the cases that shine are the ones where people uh, are not only sort of rich in theoretical insight or uh, uh, you know explanatory power but where they're articulated in ways that you know we're learning a lot from people but we, that doesn't always happen but um you know, so again, you're getting back to sampling there. Who is it that you're going to draw out? And you have to make sure that you've got a range of people and there'll be some cases that are emblematic that you can use rather more than others. I hope that helps. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's not an easy process, but there's a lot that you can do to build empathy um, and to make sure that the participant feels, you know, uh, in control of the interview process. You know, that they've... Um, that you're there to respect their worldview, to draw out their worldview and how valuable that is. Um, so we've done our Q&A and we're going to go into our workshop, uh, the first workshop now. And this is where you're going to generate some temporal insights. Um, so I'm just going to go through the brief for this. Um, so what, what will happen shortly is that Anna is going to group you into pairs and hopefully um, she'll do this at random so you won't necessarily know, hopefully you won't know the person that you're um, being paired with. Uh, you're going to be in a virtual breakout room and there are three activities to engage with. The first 
um, is a task which you should allow up to 10 minutes. I do need you to, because of the nature of Zoom, uh, to kind of manage your time if you can manage it. And I want you to create a life map. And here you're working alone, but you need to create a simple map of your past life mm -hmm. and see if you can mark some key milestones or turning points along the way. You can be very creative in the way you construct your map. You, you could work with a simple line and put markers on it, as you've seen. You could create parallel lines for different trajectories, you know, your home life, school education, personal relationships, for example. You could use one of those nice meandering rivers of experiences leading up to the present day. Some people like flow charts or mind maps with bubbles, that sort of approach. And you could also work with different time horizons if you want. It could be birth to the present day. I mean, for somebody like me, that's quite hard because there's 70 odd years to kind of build in. <laughs> that's a bit difficult. It might well be you want to focus on the last 10 years or you might even want to extend your map into the future. So have a go at doing a life map. Um, that's your first exercise working individually. And then the second task, then you'll come together with your partner. And at this point, you're going to take it in turns to interview each other. Uh, now, this second task, uh, your first interview, is a very brief discussion. And I, so I want you to swap over after five minutes. You're going to have five minutes each to talk to each other. And what you're doing at this point uh, as the interviewer is asking your interview to, interviewee to tell you in a nutshell about his or her life in the here and now who are what is important to them how do they spend their time the pattern of their day where they live and so on and see if you can remain focused on the present day that's a, a key question uh, that you're you're kind of exploring here and as i said you need to get focused you've got five minutes each for this particular exercise and then you come on to task three, where you're building on that first discussion. Um, and now, uh, again, you're interviewing each other. Um, and now you're asking your interview, interviewee to tell you how they arrived at the present day. Were there key moments or turning points along the way? Have their lives unfolded as expected? Were there particular influences on the journey? Aha moments for people when they decided to, to go a different route? Were there detours or setbacks? Where are they headed now? And you can use your life map that you would have just created as the basis for reflection. And if you choose, you can share your map with your partner, even if it's just holding it up to the screen. That, that would be fine. Or that's up to you. Um, and you've got a, an absolute luxury here because you've got 10 minutes each for this second encounter. OK, so five minutes each for the first um, research interview. 10 minutes each for the second and then we'll bring you back to the main group and just have a general discussion about what you found out uh, from that exercise um, okay so a little bit of feedback from you would be great at this point um, and what I would just suggest just chip in stick your hand up again you can leave messages on the on the chat if you'd like to um, but I uh, just to focus for a moment on that first interview that you did that snapshot here and now you know, where you're asking each other about your lives in the here and now. Um, any feedback on how you found that exercise? Did you learn very much? And the key question, did you stay in the here and now or did you find that the past and future began to, to creep in? Um, so uh, any feedback on, on that to begin with? That's an excellent question because it sort of gets at the heart of the, the problems that we have as analysts when we're building our analysis on shifting sands. I mean, you started off there saying the past is fixed and we can't change it. But actually the way that we interpret the past changes all the time, okay? And the way that we interpret the future changes all the time. You know, we, we might have an imaginary a set of aspirations. Are we gonna get there or not? So that's part of the challenge and also the joy of working through time and that we have to pick up on these changing perceptions and partly what you're getting at is changing perceptions, not just changing uh, practices and circumstances. I know that's a, a bit of a challenge, but you've got to start thinking a bit more fluid, you know, in a fluid way, nothing is fixed. I mean, I remember interviewing um, a, a child who had 
at the age of nine and she was living in a post-divorce family and uh, had a great deal of problems with the fact that she was visiting her father every other weekend and he was quite oppressive and violent and had been hitting her brother and um, at that point at the age of nine she said I said what do you want for the future of your family she said well it depends it depends if my dad gets nicer or whether he gets more nasty I don't know what's going to happen and she explained that she had this horrible feeling in her tummy when she had to go visit her dad you know as a nine-year-old that's how she looked at things now uh, I was working with um, Jennifer Flaudew on that study. Jen went back and did an interview again with her when she was 12. And at that point she said, do you know, I've just stopped seeing my dad. And she said, the reason for that is I've looked back and I realized what's going on. I didn't realize at the time, well, I kind of knew, but I was only nine, but at the age of 12, I can see what's going on. That father of mine is oppressive and I've decided not to see him anymore. And she rewrote the past script. So we went that back to the data and looked at it and we could see it with new eyes. So we always having, this is what you do when you work through time, you're having to update your perceptions yourself as a researcher. Okay, um, for, uh, there's, uh, you'll, you'll, I don't know if you've looked at any of the case data that, the data that I've sent you, but um, Andrew has learning difficulties. And um, in the fifth interview, he, um, reveals this to us. Now we did know it, but we weren't sure what the learning difficulties were, but he reveals that he can't read and write in the last interview. We have to go back through all of the interviews, five years worth of interviews with Andrew and reanalyze them, rethink them, because the fact that he can't read and write impacts on every aspect of his life. So uh, that's a challenge, but that is the, also the joy of what we do in that we have to do work through this fluid time. I'm sorry, it's not an easy answer because what I'm trying to say is that there aren't any facts when we, when we come to, to do this kind of research. We're looking at perceptions. That's a good question. And, and I mean, just bear in mind, everything we're doing today is like on the back of the envelope, you know. I mean, I've given you the luxury of 10 minutes. Well, you know, you wouldn't ever go out in the field and do 10 minutes, would you? You know, often these interviews are an hour, hour and a half or longer. We go as long as people want to speak, you know. So, but just think about what you do gather in just a short period of time. Think, uh, you know, again, this is an artificial exercise because you're, you're seasoned researchers already. You've already been out in the field, most of you, and done quite a lot of interviewing. Um, but, you know, you, you're, um, so I'm plunging you in really. Um, but in terms of building that rapport, it's just things that I was talking about earlier with one of the earlier participants about giving people permission to speak freely, making them feel that they are experts and, and they are the experts in their own lives and that they can tell you as much or as little as they choose. Those sorts of things will, will help to open it up, um, hopefully. Um, and I know it's hard to plunge in, but you know, when I did this exercise um, with, uh, uh, you know, I always join in this exercise if there's an odd number. Uh, Anna's been doing that today. Um, but the first time I did this exercise, probably 10 years ago now, with a group of students, and I was paired with a student, and I said, tell me about your life. You know, and actually that can be, that can be an incredible question to ask people, you know, tell me about what was your life like, you know, and people will come at it from all sorts of ways. But but this particular student and, and our brief was to stay in the here and now. And she said, well, it's a long story and I've got to go back to when I was four. Because uh, she had decided that uh, she wanted to do, you know, a, a change in her gender. And she knew that way back then. And it had shaped her whole existence up to the point that she uh, was able to make that change for herself you know so I mean that idea that you can stay in the here and now I don't know how many of you did but um, I suppose the point of that short exercise is just to say that you know our present lives are always informed by where we're coming from and where we think we're going through you know we are in the stream of time that was, uh, does that chime with what you've just discovered any of you I mean, again, this is an artificial exercise I've just given you, you know, this, this first bit in particular. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's, you know, you wouldn't ever start off an interview like that. But on the other hand, you do want kind of a map of where people are now. It's a way in. 
it might well be that you're, you know, you're starting very gently to say, you know, tell me about, you know, you know, what, what kinds of things do you do? You know, how do you spend your day? And then, and then you can start exploring the backstory, but you need to find out where people are on their sort of temporal map. And then you can, you know, it's uh, it's sometimes called a cartographic approach to interviewing. Again, I think this is you'll find this in um, Richie and Lewis. Um, but but this idea, you know, you know, it's a nice geographical metaphor which we can turn into a temporal one. But you know, we need to, to map the surface features, and then we can dig down. And there, uh, you know, cartography shades into archaeology, and we're sort of digging down to, to, you know, so you can gradually build things up. And you can just gently lead people back to where you want to be. So it's getting a balance all the time between the free flowing and allowing people to tell you what they want to tell you. But then they'll drift on to, off to something completely different if you if you don't very gently bring them back. I hope that's helpful, Nick. I mean, uh, I have to say, I think with a lot of these things you learn through doing, you know, and I've done so many projects and interviewed so many people over the years um, from as I said, four-year-olds whose parents are divorced to terminally ill people, where the key thing that's needed was to hold people's hands, you know. So it's incredibly different uh, depending on where people are. And I think if people have been through difficult experiences, often they're burning to tell a story um, and you can give them permission to do that just by, by saying this is a safe space um, and you can say whatever you choose. So um, it's, it, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to, to talk about, but, but basically what you're trying to do is establish enough rapport that people feel that they can open up to you. I mean, I have to say one of the ethic, ethical problems, if you like, or challenges with this kind of research is that you, people do open up. And of course, over time, they can't sort of like tell you a pack of lies or whatever, because over time things... Um, you know they've got to there's got to be a congruence between how their lives are actually unfolding and what they're telling you it's a very deep process they're engaged in, and not everyone will be able to do that some people don't want to go that deep um, because it's an analytical process and they're being invited to reflect very deeply some people won't want to do that um, and they're probably um, you know but there are others who will absolutely uh, relish that kind of thing and that's where you get your emblematic cases I guess well, let me just try and find it. I was trying to find it earlier. Um, uh, yeah, this is um, Cavail. That's K-V-A-L-E, and it's called Doing Interviews, and it was published in 2007. And he's got this idea that you've got the minor interviewer, interviewer who just minds things. And then the traveller interview who walks alongside who, well, I call it walking alongside, but, you know, you're travelling alongside people on the path with them. And that's a great way of opening things up. So I'd recommend that book. Um, anything else? I mean, I wanted to just go on to that second interview where you're turning your snapshot into a movie. And did that add anything to your first discussion? Has anybody got any reflections on that? Was there a, a you know, a palpable difference between your first exchange and your second. In terms of constructing uh, some kind of life map, or, I mean, there are lots of other things like video diaries that people will produce, but in, in terms of constructing a life map, it can be done outside an interview. Um, often that you'll, you'll find then that you've got an interview and, and you say, okay, you were gonna do a life map and they haven't done it. You know? <laughs> so you say, look, let's start off. Let's, you know, um, I'm gonna give you 10 minutes just to, to jot something down or maybe if you manage half an hour, that's brilliant. But the, the, I think the key point I would want to make here is that that data on its own is difficult to analyze as standalone data. What you're doing is a tool to, it's a tool to think with to draw out people's narratives. And it's enormously helpful. I mean, and, and it is an analytical process for the participants. So, I mean, when I first drew my uh, map, because I've done several, I decided to use different trajectories. Um, I had different lines and I had my work trajectory and I had a family trajectory. And as I was drawing this, I suddenly realized just the overlaps between the two. You know, there was a point at which uh, my first marriage came to an end 
And it had an enormous impact on my research because I was doing research on post-divorce family life and immediately I switched because I thought I can't, I can't dispassionately look at this anymore because I'm, I'm a divorce statistic myself, right? But, but also um, because uh, I found myself as a single parent, I then decided that I would invest more in work and that it was out of that process that I developed um, new strands of research. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is there's a huge overlap for me in how my work trajectory unfolded and how my family trajectory unfolded. And I would not have seen that if I hadn't written it down. You know, it was a real, a, a, an aha moment for me. Ah, you know, I hadn't kind of thought of that uh, in the same way. And the same way later when I went through a bereavement with a, with, um, a partner again a huge impact on the other aspects of my life um and i'm sorry i've lost lost the thread of where we were <laughs> but um uh, they're they're great tools to think to think with you need to combine them with um a narrative uh, you're using them to draw out people's narratives so i don't think you can ever see them as standalone data to analyze on their own you won't get so much out of that yeah yeah, and it, I feel it is a very useful tool. And the other question is, can we use it with any qualitative ap approach? So it will not be with the longitudinals or uh, other kinds? You can use it, yes, you can use it with any approach. I mean, if you're going into the field just once as a snapshot, you can use it to draw out the past or, or the future. And you're therefore you're building processual insights, yeah. even though you're only in the field once. Okay. So for sure you can. It's very clear, thank you. Thank you very much. Bethany, you still have the hand up. I don't know whether that's from the past. If it's from the past, and you still want, if you want to answer Brent's question that you you were asking, whether they, and I know we're running out of time, but we've run out of time now. Uh, whether whether anybody wants to comment on the second interview and this from snapshots to movies. Um, or if not, would anybody like to, to comment on that process of drawing a life map? Did I mean, from a few comments, people have found it an interesting exercise and worthwhile. Um, did people, did you write down some turning points or was that whole idea a bit too instrumental? You know, do you find that your lives have simply evolved and there haven't been clear markers along the way? I want to hear about, you know, what are the burning issues for the person? And it could well be that we, we need to ask that, you know, have there been other key moments in your life, maybe not related to the things that you've written about here, um, you know, that have been really important for you, just changing your perception of the world, perhaps, you know, a chance encounter with somebody in the street can do that. You know? So um, I, I think it's, it, it's worth building that, that in as a very open question to invite people. Yeah. That's, you just had some comments in the chat about, you know, the, how how participants you know what participants say how true it is uh, from charlene um, that kind of it's always their perceptions and that people can gloss over their lives a little bit so i don't know whether either charlene wants to say something or brand you want to make some final comments about that which is an ongoing issue of course with qualitative data um does anybody else want to chip in anything just at this stage i think um I think if not, just to say thank you very much for yeah. engaging with that. Oh, uh, Ching's got a hand up or Bethany, I don't know. Yes. Um, yes, um, just want to say this is a very inspir uh, inspiration. Uh, I mean, this is very inspiring to me uh, because I'm doing an interview individual decision making and live mapping tools, uh, let me remind me like decision making tree so mm. I might, when we're talking about turning point, it's, it's always the timing for people to make decision, maybe. So I might, maybe I can just, you know, combine these two tools and yeah, yes, to I analyze. Think that decision making tree and live mapping tool. Yeah. And Thank then you, you can so, see where yeah. the decision sits. You can see all the momentum building up to making a decision, can't you? The, the you know, that idea of momentum and, uh, you know, timing yeah. and, and so on. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's all part of it. Yes, very good. That would be, Thank that you. Would be Thank you. Very useful. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad uh, you seem to get something out of that. And apologies again, as Anna was saying, for a few of you who weren't able to 
pair up with somebody or the technology went wrong, but um, I hope you've got something out of that. So we're now at, uh, well, we've got run over our, we're now at 10 past 12, but um, so you've now got a, a, a lunch, an extended lunch break through till two o'clock. And I've deliberately built in extra time. Um, it may well be that some of you haven't been able to look at the data that I sent through, it's three case studies of, of young men. Um, Jason uh, runs to about 13, 14 pages. So it's quite a lot to read. Um, I hope some of you have had a chance to look at that already, but if you haven't, use the next two hours to have a break, have some lunch, but also just sit down and immerse yourself in that data of those three young men. And then we'll come back for um, some brainstorming. So just a, so this is a workshop to briefing. You're going to understand, uh, consider the biographies of these three young fathers, which you were sent. Uh, please read through the files. <coughs> um, uh, and this idea of systematic reading or, or focused reading, it's the key thing about analysis, you know, so uh, I'm sure you'll probably know that, but you could try it out here and then jot down any insights that occur to you, uh, you know, individually, but then you're going to go into your, your, your groups this afternoon and you're going to do some collective brainstorming about what those data tell you. So for Jason, you're building a case history. Um, uh, you've got a potted version of four waves of interview data for Jason. Um, and you know you need to think about what you learn about that young man, what influences his journey into parenthood, what do the later interviews add to the earlier, how is his life unfolding? Again, all of this is on your PowerPoint pack. You can you've always got to, got that to refer to. And then for Ben and Andrew, the idea is that you can build some cross case comparison. It's two contrasting cases, two contrasting trajectories that unfold differently through time. What do we learn about these young men? What are the similarities and differences between them? Why do they find themselves on different paths, even though they've got a shared, uh, quite arresting and distinctive experience in their lives? Um, so I hope that's okay. And um, we'll reconvene at two o'clock. So thank you very much for participating this morning. See you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Bye-bye. Can you hear me, Bren? I can. I yeah, well, my, my Zoom is gone frozen again. And, uh, I'll, uh, I'll share my screen and uh, we'll go into the afternoon session. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Right, so um, this is our second lecture. So um, we've looked at some very broad analytical strategies this morning. What I want to do this afternoon is, you know, is hone down a little bit on the tools and techniques that we might use when we're actually working with our, our case data. And um, because um, the illustrations I'm using are drawn from QL research, qualitative longitudinal research, how we can actually work with cases and themes and processes. Um, and, but as I said, I hope that that would um, have resonance for all of you. Uh, so in this afternoon session, then I'm gonna broadly introduce qualitative longitudinal data analysis. Uh, I'm gonna say a word about how we manage the data because that's really an, an important starting point. That idea of systematic reading um, again, I'm going to touch on that case thematic processual logic. And also for QL researchers, um, one of the things that we're doing is moving all the time from synchronic snapshots to diachronic movies. 
uh, which is just what you've been doing in your workshop this morning. And then I'm going to come on to look at case analysis, thematic analysis, processual analysis, pull out some tools that we can use and finish off with a few uh, general caveats and, and uh, reflections. Okay. I'm going to go into the larger screen. Sorry. Right. Okay. That's better. Okay. So um, before we can actually analyze our data, we need to organize them. Sorry, that shouldn't say it. Data are always plural. But anyway, so this uh, need to organize our data um, because despite small sample sizes, uh, when we work qualitatively, we gather very rich situated data. We create huge data sets, even more so if it's qualitative and longitudinal. Smith, for example, found that on a project of young people's citizenship, um, they generated over 4,000 pages of interview transcripts. Uh, and, that, and, it, and transcripts may run into many thousands of pages, the larger the sample size. Um, so there's always this problem about drowning in data this is why that process of condensing data down in order to make it more manageable for analysis is, is important. So here's a warning from Pettigrew, and I love what Pettigrew says. He's one of the organizational researchers um, who's uh, uh, really led the way in uh, QL research for uh, in organizational studies. He says, there is the ever present danger of death by data asphyxiation the slow and inexorable sinking into the swimming pool that started so clear and inviting and now has become a clinging mass of maple syrup. Um, so we have to um, really worry about this, uh, you know, or, or address this issue that, we, you know, we have a deluge of data and you don't get lost in it. So you can't see the wood for the trees. So you need to organize the data. And um, I'm back to Clen Ken Plummer here, who's again, his work I really like. He says, now all this talk of filing may sound very boring, but it is an intellectual production, a good filing system harbors your intellectual life. So we need good data management that requires planning. It, it requires building in some resources and time. Um, it's the vital foundation for building analysis and indeed for archiving, for creating legacy data, for sharing and reuse in future. I'm not going to say anything more about that now, but there is a guide um, and I've put the link there. There's also a chapter about this um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the book. Um, so uh, the other thing I want to pull out here is that QL analysis has no clearly agreed rules or procedures, as we saw this morning. That's why people talk about it as an intuitive process and so on. Um, but there are toolkits available to aid the processes of condensing data, describing data as the basis for building your interpretations. I would say that there's no substitute, though, for the initial stage of immersing yourself in the data, systematically reading and rereading it. Obviously, that's a, uh, an issue if you've got thousands of pages of transcripts. It may well be that you are um, transcribing your own interviews. Use that as an in, uh, analytical process, part of your analysis um, when you're transcribing. And you can use abductive logic to interrogate your data through different ana analytical lenses, key themes and, and concepts and so on. So um, part of the trick of that is to ask pertinent questions of your data. You know, you're interrogating it and, and you need pertinent questions. So, for example, with Jason's case data, which I hope some of you will have looked at um, over the lunch break or maybe earlier, you could, for example, read that whole transcript um, to just get an idea of Jason's parenting journey over time. Then you could ask specific questions. How does his family background impact on that journey? How does his relationship with his co-parent impact on that journey? How does his experience in prison, his custodial experience impact on that journey and, and so on? Um, getting back to QLA, qualitative longitudinal analysis, as we saw this morning, this has a distinctive logic, that's three dimensional logic built around the need to work across and integrate cases, themes and, and processes. So already you're in a, 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 um, a situation where you need multiple readings of a data set and you need to switch the analytical gaze. It's back really to that point that Gru um, Gruber made this morning um, where 
uh, you're examining your data from a range of different perspectives to see what comes out. So if we're doing case analysis and thematic analysis, we can adopt generic modes of these. They're, they're you know, standard off the shelf packages, but we would need to adapt them. So uh, for QL data, um, so that they are tied to and nested within an overarching processual framework. And I'm gonna say a little bit more about that. But before I do, QLA um, also has a distinctive momentum as well as a structure um, because we're working through different waves of a study um, and that provides a temporal framework for analysis. Um, and it's through that process that synchronic snapshot pictures of the social world are gradually transformed into diachronic, uh, diachronic um, dynamic processual movies, if you like. What we can do is set up a number of analytical files at the baseline at the beginning of our study. Um, with each return to the field, we add new installments of the story, uh, add new data to update our files. And in that way, we build up our, our layers of insight as we go along. I think it's important to say that we may not have time and indeed it may not be worthwhile doing a full cross-sectional analysis of your data after each wave. But you do need an interim reading for each and every case, um, set of case data that you've got after each fieldwork visit. And that is essential to prepare you to go back out in the, in, in the field again, because you're going to follow people where they lead. So it's a cumulative process. Um, so you, you do you do need to, um, if, if you like, you know, you're out in the field, then you're doing some case analysis, out in the field again, case analysis, so that all the time the two processes are interwoven. And in that process, we're building our cumulative insights and we can pull out fledgling themes, anomalies or puzzles in the data that we can then follow up at the next wave. So I'm gonna come on now to case analysis and say a bit about that and then thematic analysis and then process analysis and, and we're going to look at some tools. So um, with case analysis, what you're doing is an in-depth within case reading of your data. The cases may be individuals, families, organizations, communities of, of one sort or another, and we're analyzing them as discrete entities. We can build a chronological narrative of each case through the waves of data. And then we can go on to compare trajectories, build a the typology of different trajectories across some or all of the cases in, in the study. And we can do that thing as well uh, in terms of developing particular case studies for illustrative purposes or to flesh out the picture. We can single out our emblematic cases, the cases that shine, that are arresting, that have particular explanatory power and perhaps give them more detail um, uh, than, than the others, particularly where we're, we're looking at to compare and contrast across cases. So here are some tools that we can use. Um, firstly, we're summarizing, condensing data down. And, and a key uh, summary mapping tool is a pen portrait, what we call pen portraits. And they're usually maximum two pages. And what this condensing tool does is to create a, a brief biography for each case. Um, usually constructed chronologically with key themes drawn out. And it gives the basic characteristics and circumstances of that particular participant, that particular case, key elements of the journey. And it alerts us to themes that um, are important for further interrogation. You know, if you, you condense the data and then things begin to emerge then they can be seen much more clearly. Um, there's an example of a pen portrait uh, in Andrew's case files. And you can see there's just a potted history, two pages for Andrew, which gives an outline of uh, the journey that he's been on. And then from our summary tools, we move to descriptive tools. And this is our case history data. Uh, these are more extensive biographical reconstructions that we can uh, build through various sources, through field notes, transcripts, observations, um, and what we're trying to do is draw out continuities and changes for these case histories over time. Again, we can organize them by wave. This is what's happening at wave one, at wave two, at wave three, and by theme. You know, if you've got a particular educational theme or health theme, um, you would put those headings in and, um, uh, you know, describe um, the, the, the key uh, themes that are emerging out of, uh, of the case analysis. 
So we're organizing things by, by wave and theme, and that creates nice through lines in the narrative that can be pulled out for detailed interrogation. Now these case histories stay close to the data, we might want to build in quotations, and they must condense the data down. You know, if you've got, if you're working with 500 pages of, of transcript and you produce a case history, which is 500 pages, you're no better off. <laughs> Um, if they're too long, they lose their analytical power. So you've got to, that's where you're drawing out key themes to condense things down. Um, example of a case history, I think is in uh, the Ben's case files that I sent through um, to you. There's a case history there. And we can elaborate these case histories uh, by adding in researcher reflections. Um, and uh, in that way, we're, we're building um, our interpretations um, into our case data. And again, if you look at the um, case history file that's produced for Ben, you can see that we've got various margin notes there as we build our own reflections in. Um, here's an example of how you might build a co case analysis over time. This is a, a young father from uh, the following young father's study. Uh, his name is Dominique, and he's talking about the fraught relationship that he's had with his co-parent over many years. We did five interviews with Dominique over a four year period. Um, so it's just how, you know, we've, we've just focused in on that relationship with the co-parent. Um, and this just gives you a, a brief flavor of what we found out. I mean, there's thousands of pages of transcript for Dominique. Um, this is uh, Dominique at wave one. He's aged 18 and contact with his son has been denied to him and he has to go through the courts. He says, I found out ultimately that I wasn't going to be happy in that relationship, but it became quite hard to maintain a separate parent relationship. She's tried to make life as hard as possible for me with our son. Um, and then we come on uh, three years later, he's 21 by now. This is the fourth wave of interviews with him. He says, well, we're civil now because he's had contact reinstated. Um, we can have conversations. I think she's grown up and we've become more of a team. I think she sees me more as a form of support as opposed to someone against her. And then the following year, he's age 22, this is wave five. Things are still not perfect by any means, but he says, I think we're moving in the right direction. It's a working relationships. Uh, th things aren't perfect or ideal, but it's working to a degree. I think there's a lot of negative influences in her family. I've got to sort of accept that. I have a routine, but she doesn't. She's acutely aware that she's the decision maker, but she depends on me to sort out serious adult stuff. For example, school matters because Dominique is training to be a teacher. He said, I'm probably the dominant character within well for all three of us together. And there's lots um, that I could have added in here. Dominique uses various strategies to try to work productively um, with his ex-partner. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting way of building a case study, looking at the relationship between the two parents. Okay, so that's... Um, case analysis that will do for that for now. Um, we're obviously going to say more about it when we when we look at some cases a bit later on. Um, I'm going to switch now to thematic analysis. Uh, this is probably something you're much more familiar with. It's a broader cross case reading of the data to draw out themes, topics, domains of influence, patterns of meaning. And as you will all know very well, it involves labeling or coding, reconfiguring the data into thematic bundles to bring related data together across the cases, commonly using QDA software such as NVivo or Max QDA, um, or Deduce or Atlas TI. The themes may be descriptive or conceptual or both, and they're likely within QLA to be temporally inflected. They have a, a dynamic recurring or cumulative significance. So, um, a concern with employment, for example, will be framed in terms of employment pathways or journeys or trajectories. And there'll be sub themes in the, in the data and that will include things like past, present, future, continuity and change. Because we're specifically looking at those things, they become important themes of the study. So time isn't simply the framework within which we conduct the research, it's also an important theme in its own right. Now, the, the thing about thematic analysis 
And I suppose if you're going to do something off the shelf, um, you know, you'll, you'll, you know, there is thematic analysis uh, tools and procedures um, and uh, through grounded theory that uses thematic analysis. But often these packages will invite you or lead you into a situation where you are fragmenting your data. <clears throat> and my suggestion is not to do that, but to use a discrete number of emblematic themes wherever possible. And these are key themes that are likely perhaps to form an article or chapters in your thesis, for, for example. And the point I want to make here is that the more you use categorizing logic that, that, um, you know, that breaks the data down, the more uh, danger you're in of fragmenting it. And you might lose sight of the connecting logic needed to work through time. Much more about that in the, uh, the work of Maxwell. And I like this quotation from Paul Atkinson, which makes that same kind of point about not fragmenting the data. He says, on reading the ethnographic notes, I initially found it hard to escape the categories I had established. They exercised a powerful physical constraint. I'm now much less inclined to fragment the notes into relatively small segments. Instead, I'm just as interested in reading episodes and passages at greater length with a correspondingly different attitude towards the act of analysis. Rather than constructing my account like a patchwork quilt, I feel like working more like working with the whole cloth. So just bear that in mind, that idea of working with the whole cloth and seeing it as a piece. What about thematic tools then? Let's come on to something really much more concrete here. Uh, firstly, we have summary mapping tools, just like we had summary case tools. And these are uh, really important condensing tools. Um, and they usually take the form of a chart uh, that gives a graphic display of changing circumstances across the sample. It may well be that you've got a simple chart with um, a before and after, you know, beginning of field work, end of field work, two columns. So you've got all your cases listed down the vertical axis um, and uh, you, you put some particular data uh, in, or you might want, want three columns, you know, beginning, middle and end. So just to give you an example, in the following young father's study, um, we used a chart like this to show how many young men maintained contact with their child over the study period. Um, and uh, what we found was a really important finding from this exercise, because we had 31 young men overall in that study. And what we found was that over time, 28 young men stayed in contact with their child. Now that might not sound particularly remarkable to you, but um, when we began this research 10 years ago, uh, the dominant kind of framework of understanding, the dominant um, you know, way of seeing young men uh, in popular discourse, in uh, government circles, in policy, was that they were feckless. They would want to run away and not be a parent. So they just impregnated um, a partner, maybe casually, and then turn and run away. And immediately we've got some findings that overturned that idea. And so um, using a summary mapping tool can often highlight something quite arresting. And then it gives that important insight that then warrants further investigation. You know, what was going on for the three young men that didn't manage to sustain contact? Why were they different from the 28 that did? Is there a typology for the, the 28 that did? Who, some who were terribly engaged, perhaps the primary parent, uh, some who see a child regularly, some who see a child on a much more casual basis for something. Very simple little typology of the different trajectories that these young men have been on. So those are summary mapping tools. There are some examples um, in, in the course reader um, and uh, other writing on the Following Young Fathers website. So that's our summary tool. That's where we're summarizing the data. And then we come onto a descriptive thematic tools. And here I want to pull out framework grids, sometimes called matrix analysis. And I found these really helpful in my work. These are, dis are structured descriptive tools and they're very much suited to the three dimensional logic of QL analysis. They can be constructed manually in Word or Excel or through QDA packages. And they can be case led as well as thematically led, but I'm, I've got examples of both to show you in just a moment. And what they do is they provide a, real, a really arresting visual picture 
of intersecting pathways for your sample. And because of that, you can begin to see your data in new ways, link bits of data that you might otherwise not have done. And that all supports the development of a higher level interpretations and explanations. So let's, uh, let's look at some of these framework grids. So this is a thematic grid um, for housing produced for the following Young Fathers study. We produced a whole series of grids for different themes. We have one for housing, uh, we had one for employment journeys, we had one for relationship with the co-parent, which is uh, Dominique, Dominique, the example I've just given you, uh, one for relationship with uh, the grandparent generation, um, and so on. We had a whole series of these grids. So the overall idea is this grid picks up on a, on a key theme, an emblematic theme, and down the vertical axis we have all of our participants listed. I've just put three here. And um, on the horizontal axis we have our time periods, if you like. I mean, it gives snapshots through time, that's the best we can do really. But pre-interview, wave one, wave two, wave three. I mean, we actually went on to about wave five with most of the young men, but this is just to give you an example. So we've got theme, process, case built into this grid. And what we can do with this grid is look along the chart horizontally and we can see the housing journey for each of the young men. Here's Jimmy's journey, Tarrell's journey, Jason's journey. Uh, I mean, Jason we might look at because you've read some of his case data hopefully, but um, before the interview, he lived with his mother earlier on in life, moved into foster care and, and um, was living alone in a local authority flat for, for several years before we um, came upon him. At the first wave uh, interview, he was living alone. In the second wave, he was in prison. In the third wave, we were unable to contact him at all. We'd lost track of him. Wave four and five, he came back into our study. Um, so that's Jason's journey. So what you can do with a grid like this is that you can compare the housing uh, situation for each of these young men at any one point in time by going up and down the chart. Or you can build a processional analysis looking at their journeys over time. But then you can compare their trajectories. And one of the things about this, that it was so um, arresting for us as researchers when we started doing this exercise, um, we found there was a huge difference between those young men that had stable housing and those young men who didn't. In our first year of interviews, first couple of years, we, re we revisited some of those young men several times over a short period of time. You know, we interviewed them, say, two or three times over the first year. And what we discovered is that many of these young men are absolutely nomadic. So uh, one young man, for example, was sofa surfing, many of them sofa surfed, you know, living on the, sleeping on the sofa of a friend. At the next encounter, he's on remand, spends a spell in prison. At the next encounter, he's been moved into a homeless hostel. Then he goes back to try living with a parent for a little short while, and then he's back to sofa surfing again. Now, if we weren't doing this finely grained processual analysis, we wouldn't have picked up on that. But we could see it very clearly in the data, and that's why we came up with this idea that these young men are actually quite nomadic. And then what impact does that have on their, on their journeys as parents? If you're living in a homeless hostel, you're not allowed to bring children there. So the lack, if you like, of ontological security uh, which home gives us um, to use a psychological concept, which Lindsay Ladlow has used very effectively in her research with uh, young parents in their housing journeys. Uh, you know, it was a, a real lack of security and stability for these young men, which greatly impacted on their parenting. So that's an example of a framework grid then for, um, you know, which is thematically driven which is about housing. And when you've got a number of grids, then you can look across, well, what are the housing journeys and how do they relate to the other journeys? But what you can also do is create a framework grid for each case. And this is just one grid per case. And here, so this is Jimmy's case data. And here, the themes run down the vertical axis. And again, the, um, the processual analysis runs along uh, on the horizontal line. So for Jimmy now, we've got his housing journey, 
his school and employment journey, his relationship with his co-parent. And we can, we can see, uh, so uh, Jimmy was living with his mum and brother before interview, pre-interview one. At wave one, he was living with his partner at his mum's house for a while and now returned to live at his mum's house. By wave two, the child has arrived and Jimmy, partner and child are, are moving back between the, the, the houses of each of the, of the parents. But by wave three, Jimmy has fallen out with his mum and he's now gone to live with a friend from college. And there's an overlap there between Jimmy's housing journey and his school and employment journey because he joined a college course and that gave him, uh, you know, a new um, set of relationships and so on. So again, as I said, you can use this to see how different trajectories in a particular life overlap. Okay, so we've looked at case analysis tools and thematic analysis tools, and um, there are also process tools and techniques that we can use. Now, these are these are quite fledgling because not many people are doing this sort of, um, and there's a lot more to be done to develop these sorts of techniques. But basically, we can use techniques of process tracing and process mapping. Process tracing, we looked at this morning. Uh, relies on interrogating data using a series of processual questions. So for example, these are very broad questions, but how and why do things emerge, develop, grow, dissipate, or terminate through time? Are people stuck in a rut and they can't move forward? What is it that makes them unstuck? Um, are, they, are they living in the present day, this eternal present that uh, time series point to, you know, the, the, the enduring present, have they got a strong sense of the past and the future or not? Um, what trigger points or tipping points might, might there be that might set a particular process in train or move it forward? What, what provides the momentum to carry a process along? What about human agency and subjectivity and moral sensitivity? How much do these feed into and act as driving forces or constraining forces for an unfolding process? How do individuals or collectives actively create, pursue, overcome, resist, absorb, or otherwise respond to a shift in the social fabric? And we've had so many recently, obviously, the pandemic, the climate crisis, Black Lives Matter. How does opportunity, constraint, circumstance, chance and surprise come into play, along with the varied nature of interpersonal dynamics? Because Processes are, are inherently relational, as well as being fluid and multiple. Um, those relationships might be conflictual, coercive, negotiative, collaborative, supportive, and so on. You might want to, to map how they feed into a process. So those are some of the tools that we can begin to use. And we were talking earlier this morning um, with, with Anna um, about how we might want to use retroductive love logic as part of our abductive logic. So in other words, we're tracing backwards in time and then tracing forwards in time. So we're getting an idea of the temporal flow of things. Okay, and process mapping tools. Um, these are quite commonly used, very often used by realist researchers, as Anna will know. Um, these include uh, drawings, diagrams, graphs, flowcharts, and box and arrow maps network maps. Now we've just been looking at the way you can uh, map a life, but that, that's, that's what you're doing in interview. These process mapping tools uh, are analytical tools used afterwards. Um, uh, and so they've got a slightly different purpose. Um, anyway, what you can do with these tools is use them to produce typologies of different trajectories. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, so these are, uh, are important uh, ways of getting a process. And of course, they should complement whatever you're doing with your cases and themes. If you're doing a lot processually with your cases and themes, maybe you don't need these specific techniques, but these are the sorts of questions you can interrogate your case and thematic data with to draw out the processes. Okay, so I've said a little bit about cases and themes and, and processes and how we might actually analyze our data with those tools. But I do have some caveats now. Um, there's a whole repertoire of analytical tools out there and I've just chosen a few to show you here. Um, but not all of those tools are needed. 
We need to be quite selective to ensure that effort isn't duplicated and resources overloaded with the task of reordering data into too many configurations. And again, I would come back to that point that there's no substitute to systematically reading, rereading, and gradually distilling your data. You might want to do something very simple, as I did with Jason's file, if you looked at that. Edit down a transcript to pull out the key themes. You're staying very close to your data and not creating too many different ways of reading it. So that's one caveat. Um, Another, certainly for QL research, is whatever tools you use, you do need some combination of case thematic and processual analysis. You need to bear all three in mind and there needs to be a congruence between them. This is for QL research where we're trying to build a processual picture. And the reason for making that point is that too often researchers resort to off the shelf methods of thematic analysis like grounded theory. Um, which categorizes data and, as I've said, often fragments it. There's a much critique of that in, in Maxwell. You know, if, you, if you're reading an article, say, and, you know, it's, there's a standard format for producing an academic article, and, you know, you've got your sort of background and then your methods, and in your methods there'll be, you know, a few lines about analysis, and people don't know really what to say at this point, so they use an off-the-shelf label. You know, I analyze my data using grounded theory methods, you know, and they just sort of leave it at that. There's a problem whenever that happens because uh, they're not doing something that's driven by their own theoretical precepts. They're not doing question led research. They're not speaking to their data. They're just pulling a package off the shelf. The problem arises where such tools are, are the sole method of analysis. Because if you're not using case analysis or processual analysis, then the dynamic dimensions of the study can become submerged or lost to view. Or one critic critique was that, um, in fact, the dynamic longitudinal elements of the research were simply killed off, lost to view at the point of analysis. Generally, I would say there's too little attention paid to case analysis. It's really important because it's based on connecting logic not categorizing logic, which is fragmenting. And through that connecting lo logic, we can retain the temporal and contextual sensitivity uh, of our dynamic data. And as I've said, process analysis is, is still pretty much a fledgling approach. It needs more development and commitment from researchers. Another caveat that is that process mapping tools can be reductionist and lose the richness and complexity of real world processes. They need to be used with care. It particularly happens where a researcher tries to use one process mapping tool and map everything in one diagram. And it's become so reductionist and it come, becomes pretty meaningless unless it's accompanied by you know, a really quite fulsome narrative to explain it. You may well need a number of maps for different people and then you can build a typology and what I always say to people is go back to the tools that you've used in in your research the, the life mapping tools stand in their own right and we can use those when we come to write up so just a few final reflections now I think when we analyze through time in particular we're producing an ever-changing kaleidoscope of lives perpetually in the making and it does create a challenge because every time you look, you see a different picture. It's a never ending story. We can never reach a definitive understanding of the world because the world is never definitive because it's fluid. So we're building our analysis on shifting sands. I know that was a, an issue for, we had a question about that earlier, which kind of pinpointed that precise problem that we're trying to pin things down when we can't actually do that. So how do we cope with that then? Well, what we have to do is aim for something rather more modest. We aim for plausible accounts of the world that are tied to particular contexts of time and place. And we're completely upfront about the fact that our interpretations and accounts are inherently provisional. And that is fine. In this complex fluid world that we all live in, we need to be modest. And we need to embrace our interpretive lens, our interpretive approach, because it becomes no longer an optional extra. It's the essential foundation for responsible social inquiry. 
So I think once we start being fluid and working through the fluidity um, of processes, interpretive inquiry absolutely comes into its own. Um, we absolutely need it there. And finally, I would say, don't be afraid to use your intuition to find an analytical logic that fits your research questions, that's driven by your research questions, the design of your study and your journey with your data. Always speak to your data. Um, and don't try to find something out there off the peg uh, because it may not fit your data. And you can design something new, be a jackdaw, draw down different ideas that make sense of your data. Uh, be bold. Uh, you are the generation going to transform what we do as researchers, bearing in mind that methodology uh, is always a work in progress. OK, thank you. I'm going to um, stop uh, talking to you now um, and invite any uh, questions um, or uh, reflections on what I've just been talking about. I'd be very interested to hear your own experiences if you would like to do that. That's so, that's so interesting, Rasmus, because the, the, the process, you know, because we're, I mean, that idea of repeat, you know, well, cross-section analysis is what you, you're, you're doing when you do thematic analysis, usually, you know, you're, you're getting the breadth in, you're working across, you know, however, however many people you've interviewed. Um, and the idea of doing repeat cross-sectional analysis means that you're just getting a series of snapshots in time and you're not building an understanding of how each individual case changes or, or doesn't change. And we, we need to get that sort of more individual picture. I mean, in terms of analysis and writing up, I would say do as you've suggested just there, which is to pull out a number of key cases, your cases that shine, and use them to illustrate the points that you're making. So build case studies in to your writing. And do remember, and I haven't said this point, but when you're writing up, that is the culmination of the analytical process. Um, whenever we write, we think. Um, so this idea that you're gonna sort of like chew it all over, uh, get it all in your mind, and then write it up, that doesn't work, right? So use your writing every day, write <laughs> throughout your research. Every day, do some writing. Don't leave it to the end because that's part of the analytical process. I always find I'm never quite sure what I'm going to say and I sit down to write it and uh, it emerges. And I'm, uh, Charlene is nodding. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, does, that, does that help? I mean, it, it's, it's not easy, but I think you, you have to... Um, I mean, there's a couple of articles which I... I I think you might you might have already looked at my book, but there's a couple of articles on um, how researchers have used repeat cross-sectional analysis. Um, and they're really interesting because there's one article where the researchers describe all the things that they're trying to do when they use repeat cross-sectional analysis. Um, they've got so many codes, they're swimming in codes, right, at every one point in time. They go back out into the field again, and none of those codes match what they're now finding. So they have to re and code the whole lot all over again. And in order to cope with this shifting picture, which they never quite manage to catch up on, they have to do things like uh, take photo shots of all their codes uh, at each phase. So they've got all these huge mapping tools for the codes. Um, they, they set up uh, an external advisory group to advise on the codes and you think, hang on, this is analysis gone mad, you know, this is these poor researchers struggling. Uh, so I would say, don't do repeat cross section analysis, you know, depending on the size of your data set. I mean, if you're working, if you're an IPA researcher, interpretative um, phenomenological analysis, you know, that's a psychologist use that approach. You might be working with three cases or four cases because that's the level of detail that they go into. Well, then you might be able to do repeat cross-sectional because you're not swimming in data so much. But for most of us, I suspect, I mean, how, what's the size of your data set? Perhaps? Oh, the, the, the size of the cases because the size of your data depends on the number of waves as much as, as you know, the number of cases, doesn't it? So I don't think it's feasible necessarily for you to be doing repeat cross-sectional. I think the key thing would be to pull out, I mean, once you've got your individual cases in, in, in uh, you know, uh, that you've followed and you're building up your case analysis, then you can do cross-case analysis. 
And that's what we're going to try and do in the workshop in a moment, because we've got, you know, we've built a case for Ben and we've built, built a case, the case data for Andrew, and then we can start comparing them. But we're comparing the journeys, not just comparing the themes. And the themes are in there, they're in the mix, but it's processual led. Does that make a bit more sense of it? I mean, uh, remember the whole thing is picking your way through. I hope it doesn't feel like a minefield, but um, it is almost like that. Um, and, uh, and again, I would advise you to do some brainstorming with other uh, you know, researchers in your situation, share your data, get into small groups, go away for an afternoon. You can reciprocate, you know, but that is an enormously rewarding process. And you'll see all kinds of things in your data that you didn't see before, and you'll help them likewise. I hope that's a, a summer, some sort of answer anyway. It might well be that you, I mean, what would be really interesting is if, uh, you know, you can, I mean, there are some health researchers here from very different backgrounds, but you're all doing health related research, whether it's sort of medical imaging or, um, you know, nursing or something. So you can kind of piece together um, a new vision by bringing together disparate data, you know, gathered through a different intellectual uh, kind of tradition. But which will, which may well enhance what you're doing. I would really, um, you know, encourage you all to to try to build in some of that. And I think it also gets around that horrible thing of being so isolated as a researcher. I mean, why would we ever do research if we just spent three years sort of, well, obviously gathering, you know, being out in the field, but then you know, years beavering away uh, at our desks with our mounds of paper. What about us? Yeah, we do remember all of you whether whatever level you're at with your, uh, your research, you're doing research training and it's perfectly acceptable to put into your methodology chapter how whatever you started with, um, you know, you, you changed as you went along. In fact, that's one of the key things about QL research. You know, we as researchers and the fields that we work in change and grow. But it could well be, I, I noticed that, that you were doing that research. So, I mean, in terms of taking a community approach, it could well be that you're, um, I mean, one of the things that possibly that you're doing is looking at lived experiences of your local people um, against the broader sort of public policy process that's laid down by the planners, and then looking at how those two scripts mesh or don't mesh. Um, but, you know, okay. uh, I mean, that does happen. I mean, I think with qualitative longitudinal, less people tend to drop out because they get very committed to that, that process. They actually like being part of this kind of research. And because we put them first, because we're interested in their worldviews, they often get very committed. And they'll often say if they've been through difficulties, well, I want to make sure that um, people understand what I've been through and it maybe will help others and so on. But, in my, you know, we if you remember that... Um, chart that you you've just seen for uh, the housing journeys of the young fathers and Jason we couldn't contact him for two interviews and then he, he dropped back in again and when you're working through time you've always got that option I mean it, it, I, I mean how I've done that I've just sort of said that you know like at wave four I mean often you might find that at wave one you've got 20 people and by wave four you've got 14 and that's fine so you've got 14 where you've got the full picture uh, but the, the other data that you've got is still very valid because um, it still gives you the baseline and the people's starting points. Um, do you see what I mean? So you can still use it, it's, it because it's only a one-off interview, maybe. Um, it's still valuable, even, even though you haven't got the longitudinal picture. You'd have to use your longitudinal data to, to build the case. But um, you can still use all your data. So you just... And in your methodology, you just need to explain, you know, how many people you retained at each wave. Um, yeah, but going in a moment into our, our workshop where we're going to be working with dynamic data. Um, and I do hope that you've managed to at least do some reading of the uh, young father's data. Um, so what you're going to do is some brainstorming in your groups. Um, so you're going to do some brainstorming to consider uh, the emerging biographies of three young fathers. Um, and this is data from the following young fathers study. Um, and um, when you get into your groups, I'd really be grateful if you could choose a spokesperson or a scribe for your group who can give some feedback 
um, to the whole group at the end. So make that the first thing that you do. And you're gonna build on the individual work that you've done during the lunch break. And you can now compare notes, discuss your reflections. Firstly, on the longitudinal case study, and that's Jason. And then secondly, on that cross case comparison between Ben and Andrew. Um, yeah. So um, for so you've got an hour and I would suggest you spend 30 minutes looking at Jason's case history because there's quite a lot of that material and then 30 minutes for the cross case comparison. So for Jason, um, you can uh, examine that interview data that I have distilled from four waves of interviews with Jason. Um, and think about what are the key themes that shape Jason's account of his journey into parenthood and what, you know, his emerging trajectory as a parent. Now, what does the first interview tell us about Jason, Jason's life, the, you know, the main features of his life history, the current circumstances of his life? What does the subsequent interview data gathered over a three year period, what does that add to the initial picture? What are the key processes, change, changes, continuities that emerge from Jason's cumulative account? And then finally, have a think about whether your interpretations differ within the group. I mean, sometimes when I've done this session um, in person, I like to sort of just go round and just eavesdrop on the groups as they're discussing. It's amazing the, the, the different interpretations and sometimes arguments that break out <laughs> um, uh, among researchers. It's, it's quite interesting. So that's uh, building a case um, history for Jason. And then uh, the second activity, again, 30 minutes or, or so for this, um, this is your cross case analysis where you're looking at the extracted data provided for Ben and Andrew and doing, uh, looking for connections as well as discrepancies or differences in their accounts. So you can think about what the data tell us about uh, the circumstances of Ben's life and Andrew's life. What are the differences and similarities between them? Um, they, they've gone through a very similar and very arresting experience of having a child during their teens. Um, but what different challenges do they face in that journey into and beyond parenthood? Again, are your interpretations different with the group? Um, and then for um, Ben and Andrew, you've got different forms of data. You've got a pen portrait, you've got field notes, you've got interview extracts, you've got case history data, and you've got life maps. Um, have a look at them. How useful are they? Um, uh, do they complement each other? Are there other data sources that you would need to reach a more informed analysis? Um, and again, I think you, you might be surprised at how much you can actually do in 30 minutes of brainstorming around, around these sorts of issues. That's it. Uh, yeah. Oh no, hang on a minute, let me go back. Um, right, I'm gonna stop sharing screen, sorry. <laughs> Oh, uh, what would be really nice now is to get some feedback from, I think in the end, you were in just two groups. Is that right, Anna? Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. So did you choose somebody who can sort of report back to the group on what you felt about, you know, what kind of analysis you were beginning to develop? I mean, again, this is a quick and dirty exercise on the back of an envelope. Um, but sometimes just ideas jump out of the data, don't they? And uh, I hope you maybe found that. But um, so, uh, which group is going to go first? Researchers might then want to look at the accounts of young women and, and men, and they're not going to be from the same families because we're not about kind of adjudicating, uh, just understanding the different, uh, you know, the the um, different ideologies that people have and and how they live with them. But I mean, I have to say that as a mother, you know, I I kind of read. Jason's accounts I have met him I met him in the focus group he's absolutely charming and but you know I've I have my researcher hat on and then I put my parent hat on and I say no Jason no what are you doing <laughs> and uh, you, you know this is this thing about going back out in the field and how it overturns everything I mean if you just had that one snapshot interview the beginning interview and this is a reformed character you know who's who's not going to ever go back to prison and then 
as you say, that idea that you can't escape your background. But anyway, any other reflections on, on Jason? I mean, you've, yeah, you've pretty well kind of got Jason. Um, what about the um, comparison then between Ben and Andrew? And you can bring Jason in as well if you want. You build your cross case analysis in that way by, you know, comparing two and then four or whatever. I mean, again, you know, you're spending half an hour or an hour and already you've got to all the nubs of what it's about. You know, I mean, you, we, we tend to, you know, I, I've been saying earlier that, you know, this analysis is a very, very long process. You know? um, but actually, it's all there in the data. You know, I mean, if it's if you've collected your data well, if you've gathered it, if you've generated it in the way that, I mean, Carmen Lau Clayton did these interviews, and I think she was very skillful, actually. And she was just so open to the, the young men just talking. But she had to work very hard with Andrew, obviously. But um, when you've got that rich data, that idea that the evidence somehow falls out of the data, almost as if it's magic. Well, it does sometimes. I mean, these are our some of our emblematic cases, and we we had many actually. But um, to explain, I mean, I think diary methods are really really powerful. A lot of my colleagues, when we did the big timescape study, we had this huge program of research, which was sort of national uh, level data and so on, a huge team of us. And we had a five years funding to unpick family life. And this is where the following young father study began. Um, we used a whole, you know, many different methods, but um, the oral historians used uh, written diaries very, very successfully. Um, and, uh, and often people now will use visual diaries. So, you know, a photographic journey and made a conscious decision not to use these methods with the young men because a number of them were, had problems reading and writing. And because of their nomadic life, you know, they, they wouldn't easily find pen and paper. And, you know, they, many of them were disengaged from school. So it didn't seem to work for them. Um, so uh, the life, even the life maps, I mean, Andrew really struggled and couldn't produce his life map and it had to be produced for his, yeah, it had to be produced for him. But you're absolutely right. Those methods are very, very powerful. And if you've got the right uh, people um, who, who want to be reflective in, in the way that we want them to be, but they're able to do that, they're really powerful methods. And as you say, you're getting the, the picture uh, you know, processes between the waves of interviews. So, I mean, diary methods are wonderful. And we just learn on the job, really, uh, learn by doing. And I, sometimes I've been in workshops and so on. And, and, and what's really nice is to think, oh, yeah, that's what I've been doing. It just reinforces, you know, you know that you're on the right track, but you haven't quite grasped and you think, yes, OK, I'm, I, you know, it just gives me the confidence to go on. Um, so this is um, this is Jason. And um, I, I thought it was, it's an example of how you might produce a condensed summary data just by judicious editing of a transcript. So there are these 15 pages distilled from 220 pages in which I was able to pull out some key themes and participant reflections. Um, and, you know, all the themes that you've been talking about, um, his relationship with his co-parent, absolutely central to that. Um, but also his relationship with her parents his own parents and his foster mum, his criminal pathway, uh, the journey through education, work, his housing, and how all of those facets of life have shaped his journey into parenthood uh, and, and beyond. Um, and some of those themes, as I've said, derived, derived inductively from the data, the custodial journey, relationship with grandparents, mental health, domestic violence. They weren't, we, we were not expecting any of that. Um, so some reflections then, obviously he had a very deprived childhood, uh, death of his mother, no relationship with the father. As many of you say, he hasn't got those resources to bring from his past into the present day. The time spent in care, unemployment, lives in relative poverty, um, moves residents quite frequently. I mean, you might not have got that from that data, but he, he had done mental health, uh, anger management issues, the time in custody. Um, one, um, delegate from a, a, an earlier 
workshop described Jason's life as a soap opera life. And I th thought that was a really nice way of thinking about him really. But strong elements of living in the moment without that life planning. Um, and that to me came across. He has this huge commitment to his child though that, and what it, uh, you know, again, you won't necessarily know this theory, but there's a kind of theory around engaged fatherhood as, as an ideology. Um, and for Jason, the arrival of the child is that he sees it as a major turning point in his life and a rationale for everything. The things are gonna change. He's gonna go straight. He wishes to be different to his own father. So, you know, that, that idea that you're necessarily stuck in the past and you can't escape it. Um, people often do escape it, but um, just because they're aware of it and they want to do things differently. Uh, so I think we should be aware of that. But um, actually, uh, he doesn't have any professional help. Lots of these young men we picked up through um, a service, uh, a support service, especially support service for young fathers. Jason was outside that loop and that really showed for him without any sustained um, support really. Um, so you kind of see him doing these incremental nudges and eddies and drifts as he tries out a new path, but then he reverts back to his previous drinking, fighting and a return to prison. There isn't any quick fix. And people that have studied criminology, and I know that there are one or two criminologists among you, though they might have disappeared by now, I'm not quite sure. But that idea that you can just sort of switch from one path to another um, often doesn't happen. And it takes, you know, it, it takes a, a kind of lot of incremental rehearsals on a new path before you might actually, um, and support and encouragement to be on a new path before you can actually get there. Uh, Jason did have some therapy for his anger management, but um, actually it was provided through the prison service and he said he was just in with a lot of crackheads. He doesn't see himself as a crackhead. He, he uh, felt very uncomfortable with it and felt that wasn't useful. Um, highly volatile relationship with a co-parent parent who blocks contact. So for this mother, and like many of the mothers, um, at least portrayed by the fathers, they work with this idea of a kind of mother-child dyad. That's the central thing. And the fathers are somewhat tacked on. So if the father wants a relationship with the child for the mother, he should be in a relationship with the mother. And if he leaves the mother, then he, he loses the child as well. So it's like these two different ideologies coming up, bumping up against each other, in tension with each other from how the mothers see their role in life and how the fathers do. But and many of them, most of them had bought into that relatively newer ideology of engaged fatherhood. And, and you see that really quite clearly in Jason's account when he's talking about having this phone conversation um, with uh, his ex-partner's um, mother. And she says he's irresponsible. And he says, you know, being responsible is wanting to see your child, you know, and he's um, uh, going, saying that very clearly. Um, uh, I, I think the point at w where I put my parent hat on and, and thought, oh no, was when he had the second child and that was unplanned. And that led us into a whole, um, you know, a flurry of, of kind of activity and so on and thinking about family planning, about, you know, birth control. And, and there's lots in Jason's account about that and how important it is. And he doesn't do any of it. He, you know, it's the mothers who are responsible for birth control, not the fathers. Uh, uh, for us, that meant, you know, there was a lot more that, um, that family planning services and support services through schools should be doing uh, to um, support young people if they have one child so that they don't repeat uh, those things again if, that's, if they're not in a position. Because Jason has so many regrets um, about entering fatherhood in the way that he did and that lack of life planning. So overall, wishes to be a good father, but has few resources to bring and little professional help. So that's, those were our reflections um, that we've kind of built into uh, our analysis of Jason. Uh, ben and Andrew, um, Andrew, some similar circumstances to Jason, uh, but in this case, he's partnered, um, but, but it's volatile and, and violent. Um, he talks about the violence uh, and we often find when we go back again and again in the field, gradually um, stories will unfold. People will um, put down their guard more. They'll, um, you know, disclose things like the illiteracy, like the violence and so on. 
um, the illiteracy was disclosed at wave, wave five, although we did know about it or some part of it earlier on. Um, and then you've got Ben, as, you, as you've already said, completely different. And we decided deliberately um, when we got further funding for this study to build in some more middle class young men, because that enabled us to see where deprivation fitted in. I mean, all these young, you know, it's not entering parenthood early that's necessarily the issue. I mean, there are ways of overcoming that, but what resources have you got to manage it, you know? Um, and it's, it's often an issue of poverty and so on that really makes a difference. A um, lot of people um, through the years I've done this, this um, exercise, uh, kind of in comparing Andrew and Ben, felt that Andrew was a much nicer person than Ben. <laughs> which I found really quite interesting. I hadn't really thought of it like that. But, you know, Ben is prioritising his university degree, his future career. He wishes to be hands on, but he's much less tied into engaged fatherhood. Um, he's using a breadwinner model, you know, rather old fashioned breadwinner model. And he says, what's best for my child is that I go and get on with my career and then I can provide for her. And he's working with a model of friendship with the mother. Um, but, you know, you'll, you've, you've, uh, Anyway, different sources of data and what they reveal, the field notes, Andrew's field notes, record all those difficulties of communication. His, again, his living in the present, they illustrate the persistence that may be needed to draw out participants in a, in a study. But ben, Ben's field notes are much less effective, actually. Um, I wouldn't, you know, they're less informative about the nature of the interaction and, and they just repeat key themes. So. Uh, we weren't consistent in the way that field notes were, were constructed for this study, and we'd need to do better next time. Uh, the life maps is, again, I thought was really interesting because Ben's child doesn't figure on his life map. Um, and he gives very interesting insights into how he sees his future. And there's a lack of central engagement with the child. So his identity is not bound up with parenthood, and that comes across with the life map. And for Andrew, um, I don't know if you noticed, but there were two life maps, one of his past life. Uh, and then one of how he sees his future. And his past life map is empty. Um, we often found that for the young men. They're not able to articulate a clear sense of any kind of heritage or resources or things that have happened that are important for them. So his identity is very much forged through his bonds with his partner and child. Um, there's a transcript for Andrew we've already gone over. The case history for Ben, we've got eight out of 36 pages. I think this is too long. It doesn't do the job terribly well of condensing the data down. So all three sources of data for Ben, that's the pen portrait, field notes, case history, they're all rather repetitive. Whereas these different sources of data should do different jobs and they should complement each other a little bit better than we managed it here. But you'll also note how in that case, case history for Ben, we've begun to use the file to build some analytical insights through margin notes and turned it into case study data, which we can then um, uh, uh, use, you know, use to construct a case, case study. Uh, you know, you, you obviously need to build this in as a process if you possibly can. Um, I think PhD students, uh, sorry, researchers are often quite worried about uh, the scope for doing this, you know, longitudinal research in the confines of a PhD. Um, mm. And it's it's really easy. Actually, one of the things you can do at your baseline, it may well be that you have 20 people that you interview, say, I'm just plucking numbers out the yeah. air now, uh, for your baseline. And then you do that judicious following up with a subsample. Um, in fact, all the PhD students that have worked with me have done that. You know, so they've got a nice baseline of what's going on and you can explore all the past and future and current and so on. And then you're actually following uh, a much smaller sample over time. People, um, they may expect or want to talk to you again and you may not have the resources to talk to all of them, but you see, you've got to tease that out. But I would have thought that's one way of doing that. Such a 